<laughs> nice. Good to see everyone. My name is Nicholas Cho. I'm co-founder and co-CEO of Wrecking Ball Coffee Roasters in San Francisco. I'll be guiding you through the final staged session of this Rico Symposium. This session is titled The State and Future of the Business of Coffee. Well, what's business? Isn't this all about business? What do we mean by business? So for this session, we're going to focus on consumer businesses, both as specialty coffee retail and as roasting companies. After all, in the big sort of money pyramid that is the business of coffee, consumers are the big base, right? The dollars that drive everything upstream. Which is another way of saying, when we say the specialty segment of the US coffee market is worth over $26 billion or more per year, those dollars are consumer dollars. So we're going to divide this session into three parts. We'll begin with a little debate. Well, more like a little discussion. We're going to ask a question. Are we in a specialty coffee roaster bubble? And four accomplished specialty coffee industry leaders will join me here on stage to delve into that question, pick it apart. And along the way, we're going to find out what you, the audience, thinks about it, too. Then we'll invite Jan Anderson to the stage, the RICO stage. Jan is a specialty coffee uh, business consultant, and she'll share with us her research into the future of specialty coffee consumption, particularly looking at what we might expect to see from the up-and-coming coffee consumers. Uh, everyone here has heard of millennials, right? So we had baby boomers, we had Generation X, millennials. Who can tell me what the generation is that comes after millennials, what it's called? Z, Generation Z. So I can't wait to hear, as a parent of two Generation Z girls, I can't wait to hear Jan tell me about what kind of coffee I'm going to be buying for my girls for the next 10 years, or if they're going to be drinking coffee at all. And then finally, we're going to invite three special folks to the RICO stage, and we'll take much of what we've heard and discussed over the past couple of days. And as we're looking at solutions to the way that specialty coffee businesses can move forward in the next few years and beyond, we're going to hear about three retail businesses that are already doing a lot of that work today. And we'll hear about it by meeting these three dynamic founders. So as our first group of coffee leaders comes up on stage, and as this is, the, of course, being the 10th RICO Symposium, we wanted to start this session with a question that would have us reflecting on the past 10 years of our industry. But that's ultimately about describing what's happening now and in the near future. Specialty coffee has been a term that's been with us for a few decades now, but it's really coming into its own over the past 15 years or so, as we've seen a proliferation of specialty coffee roasting companies that display all the hallmarks that we expect to see these days from a third wave coffee company. A certain sort of design aesthetic, a certain way that we talk about coffee. We, while it's a certain leave of wide range, a fairly wide range, a certain uh, flavor profile that, that, um, of the experiences that we offer and so on. So in an age where so much of our focus has been to re-educate our coffee-consuming public, to accept and embrace our new point of view about what coffee can be, we find ourselves in a situation where certain markets, certainly the market where I live in San Francisco, especially coffee can feel really crowded. So many players, let's name them all, like Pete's, Equator, Blue Bottle, Ritual, Cyclass, my company, Wrecking Ball, Red Bay Coffee, St. Frank, Mr. Espresso, Phil's, many others I haven't mentioned, and many I won't mention for reasons. <laughs> um, anyway, the San Francisco coffee roasting com uh, community is really crowded, and yet I'm hearing about even more new specialty roasters that are about to start right now in San Francisco. What's happening? Why is this happening? A market bubble, while its definition is something that we're going to get into in a moment, can loosely be defined as a market condition for which a rapid and significant market correction is Im imminent. Like I said, we'll talk about it some more. We all remember the American real estate bubble from a few years ago, from 10 years ago, actually. The dot-com bubble was a thing about 10 years before that. In both instances, we all look back with the benefit of hindsight, and we see all the signs of what was going to happen. So while our current specialty coffee market at the roasting and retail level are small compared to what those market bubbles were, they're a really big deal for us in this room, right? So while you may have never asked yourself this question before, let's take this opportunity to ask ourselves this question now. Are we in a specialty coffee roaster bubble? So let's really ask it now. Like, really, really ask it and answer it. So what I'd like to do right now is, you might have gotten the notification, I didn't check 
Everyone get your, your, your Rico app open, please. Now let's see if this thing worked. Aha. So the first thing that's on your feed there is a little poll. So click, the, click take the poll. What? It says yes, no. There's supposed to be, there's supposed to be an uh, undecided, but let's just click one or, one or the other. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're yeah. going to go ahead and poll the audience, and you're going to select yes or no now. And then at the end of the debate or discussion, we'll take another poll and see if your feelings have changed, if at all. Uh, if you don't feel like you have a yes or no answer in your heart or in your mind, then don't answer it. It's okay. And, you can, and if you have an opinion at the end, you can ask, answer it then. Cool? So we're going to give a, another 30 seconds to a minute for everyone to do that. I'm going to vote. You all don't get to vote. I got to vote. I got my phone out. Okay? Everyone voted? There was no cell phone number on the stage, uh, on the screen this time. Okay. So joining me in this discussion are four leaders of our specialty coffee industry. First, she's the Chief Commercial Officer and Senior Vice President at s and Coffee. Round of applause for Tracy Ging. <laughs> Next to Tracy is the Founder and President of Revelator Coffee, Joshua Owen. <laughs> Teresa Von Fuchs is the Head of Sales at Bellwether Coffee. Round of applause for Teresa. And finally, Dan McCloskey is the founder and chief creative officer at Premium Quality Consulting. Round of applause for Dan. So Dan, let's kick it off with you. Okay. So when we say bubble, especially coffee roaster bubble, like what do we mean by, mean by bubble? Yeah, well, you pointed out that it, uh, it also, it, it means that it, it's begging a correction. But I think uh, uh, the other part of the definition of a bubble is that it's when the value of something is uh, highly overvalued above its intrinsic value. And so the question, I think, if, if we use the term bubble, is, is coffee overvalued in that way? And I think uh, the, the quick answer is no. I think what we've learned from the session so far is that, if anything, it's undervalued. Um, there might be a question of whether uh, particular brands are overvalued. Uh, the, that could be true in different places. But I really think what we mean when we say a roaster bubble, and we start to talk about that, we're talking about uh, saturation of the marketplace. You were just alluding to that in the opening. And, uh, and uh, our company thinks about brands. We count brands, and we think about them all the time. And there, there may be some evidence to, to suggest that there is a kind of oversaturation that may have happened. Uh, we, we have uh, counted in the last 10 years um, uh, an increase in the number of brands per year that have been founded. Actually, it's about 70 per year. We've counted 600 new brands, 619 new brands, since uh, uh, 2008, um, so about 70 or so a year. That's a doubling uh, from our data uh, uh, per year of brands before 2008. So mm -hmm. there was absolutely an increase. We, we dubbed this the tidal wave. Uh, and we think it's a, uh, an increase. And actually, we see that about uh, two-thirds, almost exactly two-thirds of those brands exhibit what we would call third-wave characteristics, which we, 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 you know, we measure and talk about. So one might really feel that there is a kind of saturation happening. Um, while doing some homework, and I don't know if you have the slide available, but while doing some homework, I found this article um, that was that from my hometown of, of Chicago, uh, talking about, from Cranes, a, a very good uh, business magazine, talking about the anxiety, the local anxiety of coffee producers and, and uh, analysts uh, about the market. You can see some of the things that they're saying, that, it's, that the hard times are going to come and the danger of this kind of thing is saturation and there are only so many neighborhoods. Um, the funny thing is that this is from 1994, this article. This is from the first, actually, first online edition of Cranes. Um, and uh, personally, it's the year I started in coffee, and, um, and they really, uh, the, the, the link is there, and I'm, I'm sure you guys can, can find it, but uh, they really get it wrong. In, they got it wrong in 1994. One can absolutely understand their anxiety. In, uh, lots of people were entering the marketplace. Uh, it certainly seemed like there weren't any, there wasn't any space, uh, that there were only so many educated urban coffee drinkers. But they, they totally missed 
what was going to happen. Um, I mean, I, I missed what was going to happen. In right? terms so of like the, the third wave. Thing. Yeah, the third wave. And, and, and I mean, most of the companies that are in the article are no longer in business. Some of the consultants are no longer in business. So I take that as a personal uh, warning. <laughs> but uh, anyway, but so I, I think it's interesting. So I, I think the point is, um, I, I, I think we talk, I think to answer your question, what do we mean? I think we mean saturation. And then the, que the real question is, is there saturation? Um, and, and I think that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about now, right? Most definitely. Tracy, why does this matter? <laughs> like, why should anyone care? Well, well I, I have a different take on what I think the bubble is. And so I think there are markets where saturation is happening. And, and, um, but I, I think the bubble is more around a style of doing business. I think that, that the two-thirds of thir you know, uh, brands that are, are showing third wave characteristics, I think that refers to a particular style of doing business that's going to get very pressured in this new environment. So there's no doubt that there's low barriers to entry. We're going to see a lot of roasters continue to come on. Big roasters are, are entering the space. Big brands that have never been into coffee are entering the space. You've got people like Amazon that are poised to disrupt. You've got other technology that's poised to dis disrupt. So what I think, when I look at that term bubble, you know, I think about, it, it, are we detached from reality? And I think that we are in a bubble, because I think that the, specialty, the style of specialty coffee roasters um, that has been successful or popularized to date um, probably isn't going to work in this new market environment. And I think that is what's going to get corrected, is that the reality of what we think is going to be successful is not going to base, be based on what was successful in the past. Yeah, I just would add, I feel like there's a kind of a third wave user manual that's like been shared and, and, and it's, it's quite easy to, uh, to... It's like an Ikea manual, <laughs> it's a bunch of drawings, yeah, exactly. no words. It comes with a little wrench. It's you know? simpler yeah. than that. And, and it's always a little bald man and no one else. Right, yeah. right, right. Josh, so Revelator's been around for what, five years now? Five years. Yeah, and you're growing in the southeast part of the United States. Um, a lot of your growth has come through mergers with other companies, sometimes who are struggling a little bit, and you know, with the injection of some capital and some business know-how, be able to um, grow in that way. So what are you seeing out there as you're growing Revelator? I think I would sort of echo what, what, what Tracy said, which is it's not about oversaturation in this absolute sense. It's about oversaturation in this relative sense, that there's too many people trying to do exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is a moment where, as we talked about in the previous panel, innovation really matters. Um, and, and yeah, you know, I think in the Southeast, which is a region where specialty coffee and third wave coffee maybe came a little bit later uh, in some of these cities than it did where you're from, uh, we're seeing people using that manual over and over and doing the same thing over and over. And, and yeah, it's just, it's ripe for innovation. Yeah. Um, Teresa. So Bellwether Coffee, we had Arno up here earlier. Bellwether's counting on and not being a bubble, like a, a growth, maybe in a, again in an innovative sort of way. So right. what are you seeing out there? Well, so I feel like, again, we're talking about the definition of terms, right? So even when we talk about market saturation, are we talking about retail spaces that are following this IKEA manual? Or are we talking about the roaster business model? Because mm. I think the roaster business model is what we've definitely seen changing, right? If you thought that you were going to invest in infrastructure, pay the bunch of money for this thing, have your cool cafe, and then also sell a bunch of wholesale to every cafe around you, that model has definitely changed over the last mm. couple of years. Like it, it but, but what we see, sorry, didn't I? Sorry, go ahead. Um, but what I feel like we all see is that that's not happening because people are are greedy or feel like they just downloaded a playbook and are going to go win. Yeah. It's happening because there's this real like engine of enthusiasm. Like people have broken supply chains and really done things way outside the economic sense, right? In order to have access to coffee and roasting, right? People do it when it doesn't make sense for their business because they love it. They love it and they want to do it. And I think when you watch people making those kinds of decisions around the things that they really love, Yes, some businesses will fail. We've all been to great restaurants that didn't last. But I also think that there's, there's more to it that we could do to support that engine of enthusiasm rather than you know, whine about how it's affecting our business model. Is it that people <laughs> love coffee? I, I hear you, and for a long time we've talked, like the buzzword was like passion, right? Passion for coffee, passion for a lot of stuff. 
Um, is that really what's driving people starting businesses? I mean, I think that there's a difference between people starting businesses and people who've been in business, fell in love with a thing, and then want to take their craft to the next level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I feel like when we talk, we're asking a specific question about a roaster bubble, right? And when you look at the people that are getting into roasting now, they're not all brand new businesses, right? It's a lot of people who've had cafes, understand the business model of coffee, and want to take this next step, right, for their passion or their knowledge base. Or one interesting thing we hear a lot, as I talk to a lot of people about who want to start roasting, is that they want opportunities for their staff. Right. And I think that that is a, a great reason to expand what you do in your business. Right, but then let's say you're a cafe and you weren't roasting coffee before and, and you start to. And we'll get a little bit into why we put roaster into this, into this uh, question and didn't leave it out and just say specialty coffee. But so you're a cafe, you decide to start, decide to start roasting and you build into your plan, well, we'll roast for ourselves and then we'll get some wholesale. And I think that last little part has been sort of automatic in our industry for a while, and now I, I see it over and over again, many friends opening uh, a ro roasting companies and then getting started with certain assumptions in mind, and then all of a sudden they're just like, no one wants to buy our coffee, you know, because there's all these other people yeah, out they're there. Running they're running into they're, business problems is what they're running into, yeah. yeah. Right. That's, that's, I think that's one the learning curve of new business. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that really struck me from yesterday was um, Andrea Ely showing the retail dollar value uh, growth versus the actual consumption growth. So the consumption growth wasn't that impressive, but the retail value grew quite a lot. And if you look at what's underneath that, a lot of that is, it's not coffee, it's not the bean, it's, it's the delivery mechanism, it's single cup systems, it's, it's other forms. Differentiation really happens through the delivery, through consumer products. There's less and less opportunity for differentiation at the bean level. And, and I think what was even more troubling about that is that we heard all, all day yesterday is that dollar value growth isn't getting shared with the farmer. And we heard Alejandro say, you know, it just, it's not in my interest to keep following, my economic interest to keep following every whim of every little micro roaster that comes down to visit. And, and so that piece has to get corrected. If, if, if we're gonna keep struggling with differentiating the bean, that's where this wholesale model is going to get really tough. <laughs> right. I see it in the retail model too. Like yeah. I've actually been talking to a lot of retail cafes that know that there's no opportunity for wholesale. They don't want to do that. And they're not necessarily even getting into roasting for this romanticism of sourcing. That was honestly one of my first fears when I was first talking to Bellwether, where I was like, oh great, and we're going to power a bunch more people to go down and bother farmers, right, and get in their way. <laughs> but, but that's actually not necessarily like the movement. It's the same way that we took brewing and espresso preparation to this craft. People want to apply that to roasting and for that I feel like we should give them better tools and so while at, you know not wanting to cross over into the infomercial sort of level so how would a bellwether Twist type, type uh, <laughs> product like disrupt that how would, how would that well, in the, in the simple way, we really tried to make roasting more accessible. So from an economic standpoint, but also from a usability standpoint, Arno talked a lot about that. But also this idea of like we don't have great tools for roasting. Super sorry, other roaster manufacturers out there, right? But it's not been a space we've innovated in in the last 10 years. People are usually going to a vintage roaster, not necessarily like a and new there roaster. there have definitely been new roasters and new upgrades to a same basic concept of the technology, right? But we've been having great conversations about brewing preparation and sourcing for the last 10 years, but we're kind of not looking at one other fundamental piece. And that's really what Bellwether tried to do. It's ventless and electric, we'll talk about it later. Gotcha. And, and gotcha. the customer. I mean, so we've been having great conversations about roasting and sourcing and brewing and the equipment, and, and the customer's been largely ab absent, the coffee right. drinker. The consumer, <laughs> yeah. right. And, and I think that's what, you know, one of the things too that I think is gonna challenge this, this sort of style of, of coffee, especially coffee roasting that we've sort of, the manual sort of uh, depicts is, is that we keep defining quality in very um, nuanced, almost kind of nerdy, you know, terms that we know aren't translating to the, to the coffee drinker. It's not that it's not important, it's not that that shouldn't still be a pillar of specialty coffee, but, but the, you know, the, 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 the grind particles, you know, I mean, that it's just, it's getting lost on, we're losing, we're alienating coffee drinkers in that process. And when you really start to look at what defines quality from a consumer mindset, it's other cues, it's like freshness, it's like service, it's like being welcomed. Sustainability has an amazing halo over the perception of quality in the consumer's mindset. So we're gonna have to get much broader in how we define quality and, and um, but this yeah. speaks to the whole idea about sat sorry, 
it's the Tracy T show. Um, <laughs> this speaks to the idea Which about saturation. <laughs> Um, is that it's, I think it's a good opportunity, right? Competition is going to force smaller businesses to innovate and make themselves differentiated, right? We all say the same things about our business models. Well, let's talk about that. Let's unpack that a little bit more, that idea of differentiation, because this makes me think about when I started in specialty coffee, it was as opening a little coffee shop in Washington, D.C. at the beginning of uh, 2002. And when we did that, we were the first, no one had ever seen latte art before, like, you know, no one had ever seen sort of single origin stuff before. Uh, we were doing, you know, as the kids like to say, we were blowing minds left and right. And fast forward to today in San Francisco, and yeah, a lot of people, like a lot of us, you know, again, speaking about the Bay Area, a lot of us are sourcing coffee from the same importers. You know, very often I hear a lot about in the Seattle area, for instance, like, you know, great importers like Atlas. It's like, oh, like every little roaster has the same, you know, coffees from, from Atlas and from the other other sort of places. So, you know, we're, it, we've been talking about like differentiation as a solution to maybe things getting crowded. But let's talk about like that crowdedness. Like what is it that we're seeing over and over again? Like what are some of those things? Well, I, 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 I don't Go want to step on you, but, but uh, you said, what, what are we seeing in progress, right? Is that, is that the question? Well, what, are, what are those things, like sort of, I'm still sticking with the problem a little bit more. Well, that's what yeah. everyone, but yeah. everyone, if you're bringing up sourcing, right? right? Everyone talks about how they source coffee, but they all do it right. the same yeah. way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We're we not are, talking and, about and, the craft yeah. of roasting. We're more director than the yeah. other, like direct trade, you like direct trade, and now we've got director trade, yeah, yeah. you well, know, direct so, so I think in some concentrated places, it's a real problem. I mean, I, 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 I would not. I would still have, say it's a real opportunity. Yeah, well, well, but I would say in Logan Square, where I live, in Chicago, you shouldn't open a coffee uh, uh, brand there. I just Unless recommend. You're I mean, do it better. Uh, well, uh, if you can or do it better, that's fine. I mean, maybe you should buy one that's not doing so well, and but but and and, and make it better. But but uh, but but there are places where uh, where where latte art has, is going that um, where it's a huge opportunity. I mean, and and uh, Arno used the word democratization of coffee, and maybe I'm derailing your your your, your, your intention here, but. Uh, uh, we see, uh, okay, the playbook, but it, okay, but it's going to places where uh, they haven't had a, th a really cool upscale coffee. I was talking to the guy, a guy who owns a, a really cool roaster in Rockford, Illinois, which is a little town, uh, in Beaumont, Texas. I mean, the, you know, so so there, there's, there's, yeah, there's places for it to go. So I think there's a lot of Montana. There you go. I think there's a lot of room uh, for. Uh, for the democratization of the spread of this form, uh, maybe not in, in San Francisco or Chicago or Williamsburg. But, but the reason I, you should speak. Oh, I was just saying, <laughs> <laughs> even then though, I think the conversation, and this is a funny thing to say to this room, but it, it continues to be too much about product, yeah. right? That you've had years and years of fighting to make the product itself better, and it's gotten to a point that it's good enough for most consumers, yeah. and they don't actually care if it gets any better. And so it, the conversation has got to shift towards this broader experience and how do we give them a better experience and not just a better cup of coffee? Uh, because for most consumers, they can get a good cup of coffee that they're happy with. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was just going to comment that I, I don't quite buy into, I, I, I'm not saying that there's no space left anywhere, but I don't quite, quite buy into there's some pockets in Bozeman that you can still go to. Cause this is where I think that the consolidation, the larger brands, Amazon, you know, d distribution strengthening, I think that's where it's going to really play out, where they're going to figure out how to get really good coffee into those further to reaches. Bozeman. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and so I, I, think I, would, I think I would really challenge that that's going to be a, 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 a shielded model. I still think you're going to have to look at the playbook and, right. and anticipate some, right. some different but I, plays. I, so so what, what, what I think is that I, I look at the restaurant business, right, which, which coffee, uh, I was talking to someone and they were saying that, that, they, that we don't admit that we're part of the restaurant business, we're in the restaurant business. And, and, and then I think of... Uh, they don't that, want us you? to be a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so he said that. And, and I agree with that in the sense that, that I think that uh, um, uh, the restaurant business is a diverse business. And, and I think where, where you get to in the restaurant business, it, and just speaking about the United States now, uh, is you, you we finally find ourselves in a place where even in small towns that didn't have uh, great food necessarily, you have great food, but you also have 
corporate food, or you know, or you, you have you have Olive Garden, and you have a restaurant that that, that is that makes a, a upscale Italian food, and they live they live t t together, right? So, and I feel like they do for now, do, but we hear about Olive Garden and companies like that kind of on a decline, right? Well, okay, so so but then there's but, a new version, but of Olive but maybe Garden, that's right? but but in a way, I, I guess I'm just saying, like in terms of like the the, the, the threat of consolidation, and Tracy, I'm not sure if this is exactly what you're saying, but the threat of consolidation taking over uh, the, the artisanal or the craft. Uh, I, I'm not worried about that either, right? Because I, I think that there's an opportunity for both to live together. And particularly, you know, I think we're at this moment where, yeah, there's all this consolidation happening, but you've also got all this data that says consumers really want local business, yeah, that's, right? And that's so, right. You know, yeah, it's gonna be Amazon who's gonna get the product into people's homes in some of these smaller markets but there's still a lot of room to have a local business that people can actually engage with and be part of the community, and, and that's really important. Especially when we make an effort to open businesses that are contributing to our communities, right? Like when you don't just open a cafe in Bozeman because you're like, I hear rent's cheap there, right? You open a cafe in Bozeman because you live in Bozeman and you want a fantastic community space, right? And then you should develop that rather than on the playbook. Ideally, it's great to watch people build those businesses based on the needs in their actual communities. But sometimes that community space is like that third place thing that we all know and love about. You know, it's the place that's important for individuals and it's like their Cheers bar, their friend's cafe, like, you know, going to the cafe. But in a way, as much as that concept still exists, I, at least, you know, my experience in San Francisco is that you'll see People use specialty coffee shops as their third places, plural. Mm -hmm. So the four or five places, you know, when I'm this part of town, I'm near work, there's a blue bottle there. You know, when they're over here, there's a ritual, there's, you know, whatever, whatever. If the line's too long, they just jump over to the next one. Right, right because... But why is that bad? Well, I guess the issue, again, is the, the, the crowdedness of the market, right? Whether it's saturated or not. Where it's bad is, you know, you want to be able to project growth, and if you're, you know, depending on your sort of ambition as a company, then you might need to raise money or ask for loans or things like that. And so, you know, we're all here in a way trying to look at that crystal ball, magic eight ball, and see into the future and try to anticipate sort of what's going on. And so, you know, one of the reasons we brought this question up is that, well, if the answer is a little bit more on the yes side, we, we need to be... A, Wide, our eyes wide open about that and aware, right. and it needs to inform our behaviors. I think one of the things that I'm trying to say, I'm not, I'm not going to act like uh, you know, Coke and Amazon are going to take over everything, but, but what I don't, I don't, I'm not comfortable with, it, with is being in the position of like, yes, there's still opportunity, especially coffee roasters, go to the smallest town possible and be the smallest <laughs> business you can be. So, uh, so, yeah, we, we're not uh, so our answer yeah. to these changing economics and these changing market forces is go be small. I don't like right. that. But I think the, right. the answer is go be our, I don't think that's our answer. I think that's what people are doing. But, uh, like people are, people are still opening small businesses. I, I have yet to be in a room where people ask themselves, are we in a bakery bubble? Are we in a, cat, like, are we in a, a bagel shop bubble? But I, right? I do think the answer though is go be different, right? It's you gotta go do something different from what other people are doing because there's too many people trying to do the same thing. And so, Going to a small town is one answer to that. It's not the only answer. It's not the best answer necessarily. And I wouldn't say go to a small town. Sure, but you live in a small sure. town. Sure, <laughs> but but <laughs> it's it's one avenue where there's still room to be something different. Um, but there's also, I think there's room to be something different in San Francisco. I think um, there's yeah, two. Right? Yeah. Let's look at. I hate to bring it up on stage, but let's look at avocado toast. We're definitely in an avocado toast bubble. People, <laughs> people definitely yeah. still I, eat avocado toast. I was toast. never in the avocado toast bubble. I never. I'm just saying, I was right? Never there. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's an interesting segue because avocado toast. There's no avocado toast place, right? It's a thing that is served at a certain place. <laughs> but one and, person did it. Everyone did it. Right. But like, but you it, know, one of the things that we like to talk about at, at Rico Symposium is, and we've talked about already on this stage over the past couple of days, is you know, new market opportunities, be them in, in new demographics or sort of in new, essentially sales channels and new concepts. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Like, so we've said differentiation. Are we going to talk about cold brew? We'll, Oh, God, no. <laughs> or I'm excited not? about specialty coffee in more places. Right. Well, I mean, that's a good example. I mean, that has become, I mean, you said it, now we have to talk about it. Cold brew. It came out of the, the um, I don't know why I coughed. The, uh, th that's another channel, right? That's another place where specialty coffee can go. And if you're a roasting company, it's another 
profit centers and other. It's but I, I don't know if we, I, like I, I don't know if, if if there needs to be something new necessarily. I mean, I think I think innovations that make things easier or that make things cooler or you know like a, a new way to play music and you're like okay. But I I mean it, you know in some ways it's a simple concept. It's and I go back to this analogy of the restaurant business is like, like you know if you're opening a restaurant. Maybe you're going to find a new cuisine that no one in your town has tasted, but you're just probably you're not. I mean, certainly in some places you're definitely not. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I think new just means uh, uh, doing something a little, maybe a little better. I think you know, doing something well. Uh, and, and I think there is room in the in the coffee business for doing things better in the cafe business for sure. I think that there and there in are the some space. you know, and there and there are some you could critique some of the characteristics of the third wave. Uh, in ways that, that that I think could be could be challenged and changed uh, through through different business practices. I mean, I go back to just the su the supremacy of experience over product, right? Even as you talk about cold brew, that's another product conversation. It's how do we create new products? That's the experience for of the product, though. Sure, right? but I, I I think that the most room for innovation in particularly the retail side of the industry is how do we what experience do we give to the customers who walk in. Um, what customers do we give an experience to at all? That's right, a big just, part of it. Yeah, Phyllis yeah. mentioned that yesterday, right? Yeah. Like 34 million consumers that we're probably not reaching. Yeah. And, and, and that's where there's, I think, a lot of room for innovation. So it's not just about, oh, go create a new product. It's just give them a different experience from what they've had going. What do you, going, what do you mean by different experience? Like, I mean, uh, just to interrupt, like, for instance, I like to go to Los Angeles. Intelligentsia's Venice Cafe was known, as, you know, that whole... When in its heyday, especially, and this is a whole different consumer experience. In fact, the people who built that shop, they wanted to break up that you queue up at the register and then you get the, the, the coffee from the barista sort of co uh, experience. That didn't catch on. No. But they tried. Uh, they did, but it didn't catch on. It's a successful shop. It's not like, as yeah, successful that, as it was 10 years ago. Empty? What's that? It didn't catch on. Is that shop empty? No, I'm saying that that sort of trend of trying to be disruptive in that way, very often, I mean, when we say something's disruptive, we really mean it's disruptive and successful, right? Otherwise, we don't really, it doesn't show up on our radar. Um, people have been trying different things. So, so, again, what do we mean by creating new experiences? I, I think so much of the, I mean, going back, there's not really anything new. It's more about taking different pieces and putting them together in a new way. Um, I, I can't answer the big question necessarily. I can tell you what I'm obsessed with, with, with Revelator, and, and that's about how do you take this local cafe experience and scale that to a larger company? Um, because there is this, this craving in communities for genuinely local shops uh, that are actually part of their communities and put on community events, and, and none of the, the sort of third wave grocers who've gotten to sort of serious scale have have done a lot there, so I think there's there's room there, but that's just my answer. So we've already said the word restaurant a couple times, um, and I think it was maybe in our conversation on the phone before where it came up, you know, that there had been this sort of like land grab gold rush when it comes to especially on the retail side and especially in the established markets that have sort of matured uh, as we know them to be today, and that one point of view might be, well, what we've done is we've sort of now become like restaurants, because that's actually was sort of our destiny, especially coffee retail. I think we've talked about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 I have a theory of the American marketplace, and I think what I, I talked to some of my European friends, and, and, and uh, they, uh, it, I, I think that they find it quaint, because the idea, I, my theory of the, speaking for just myself, is that we just didn't have things in food or in coffee, and we, we found them now. So now, now we have coffee. There was, so the, the land rush was there, you know, there, uh, intelligentsia could be new uh, in, in LA, right? Um, you, could be, you, know, you could be doing something new. And that's done now. And I mean, okay, okay and, and maybe in Bozeman, but now it's done maybe in Bozeman, right? So, uh, uh, but, uh, so now it's about repeating because this is a product we repeat every day, right? In, in, a, in this wonderful way. And it's, a, and it's a simple thing that we do to give ourselves pleasure and, to, to make our lives better in, in that simple way. It's not something special and new. It is, it is special, you know, it's, it's two things at the same time. So to, to, that's why for me, the idea of the restaurant resonates because I feel like in America, we, ha we finally have a mature restaurant market. I think people in other parts of the world, would, would, they've had a mature restaurant market for hundreds of years, so. But I guess when we talk about restaurants, I'm sorry I didn't finish yeah, yeah, this part, which is the risks 
that we're all sort of here about in terms of the, the failure rate well, for restaurants. That yeah, now, we're, now we're getting into a maturity where that's applied to us. Twenty six percent. There's a, a myth that ninety percent of restaurants fail. It's actually twenty six percent fail in the first year in in, in the U.S. and uh, it's a lot. It's kind of a lousy business, right? It's it's a hard business, uh, but it's also a business that every human uh, we all love because we go we go to them. So there's also a statistic that that uh, the average restaurants are only making like five percent profit. So, I, I mean, I think if the subject is a bubble and we're sort of orienting towards restaurants, then we are we are orienting towards a very di different economic model than than what I think specialty coffee roasting had promised. And that's why I think the product conversation is interesting because. I, I think there is something new to talk about and that, that people are drinking coffee not just for that morning wake, wake me up or energy or that kind of afternoon relaxation. People are now drinking coffee as a refreshment beverage, as a functional beverage, as something to wash down a food. A sensory experience. A sensory experience. But I, I think that, that all creates opportunity to introduce specialty to a broader range of coffee drinkers and if we, if we don't want to be in that space, we in the broad terms, you know, somebody else will get into that space and it's going to change the landscape fundamentally. But that requires innovation, right? And I think the conversation we had had was the extent to which the coffee industry kind of silos itself off from the rest of the food and beverage industry. Um, and there's sort of this purity that people are trying to protect in the product. Mm. And, and to, to get into the spaces you're talking about where, where coffee is a refreshment, it's part of a beverage, it, you, you have to be prepared to treat it as an ingredient in this broader sort of nourishment conversation. Um, and I think a lot of the, the third wave roasters are afraid of that because they're afraid of getting away from that sort of purity of product. Yeah, I, we're gonna, I'm just uh, more hopeful than most people. But I really <laughs> feel like that, that people are, are taking ownership of things and are innovating in smaller ways or personalizing Right, not just the consumers, right, but businesses are fitting into their communities and they're trying to update their craft and they're, there are plenty of places that we can innovate, we can bring specialty coffee to more people, we can make it more accessible for, I mean, I'm super hopeful. Yeah, we have about three minutes left not, and I would be remiss hopeful. if I didn't talk a little bit about uh, wages, in the, especially because we're talking mm -hmm. in the United States. I'm in San Francisco, in July, our minimum wage goes up to $15 an hour. Uh, our shop actually made the preemptive move of our starting wage now is $16 an hour for no experience and, and if you have experience like $17, $18 an hour. Um, so that all said, you know, just to point out like there's a, there's a lot more pressures that are kind of pushing on, on different sides. Yeah. Um, but that all said, I just wanted to mention that but as a factor. So we're asking this question, it really is the more the broader question or the more general one that this is a subset of is like what's going to happen what's going to happen in the future and it, to some degree um we could all agree on this idea that well the market's maturing you know the bubble is a certain type of outlying condition but things are maturing for sure so regardless of the bubble question like what does that sort of mean in this within this topic, like wh where are we gonna see things continue to move? Especially, I know Dan, that's where a lot of your, your work is and, and Tracy as well. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I hope I didn't sound pessimistic sitting next to my, my friend here, but- uh, We're but all anyway, smiling. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, no, but I, I, I actually think it's, it's incredibly positive. I think that, that uh, the forms uh, that maybe are, maybe some forms are tired, like some, some style is tired. You were saying, Tracy, about, about, I don't know if you said they was tired, I, I'm saying that. <laughs> but, the, but the style might have to change. But I think that the, the opportunities for coffee are, are fantastic in the future. I think that you have to be a business person and not just uh, a revolutionary, right? I think in the past there was space as the wagon was going across the plain to grab the land, right? To, to, to be, a, to have a, you know, a mission before you had an understanding of a P&L. And I think that's probably got to change for, for people in the future. But there's tons of it's more accessible. It's 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 a it's it's a really big opportunity. So, any thoughts, Tracy? Well, I, I mean, I think you you and I had a conversation in the preparation, and, and I just um, this isn't the best analogy, but just for lack of a better one, I, I feel like we we um, there, there's sort of been a there's kind of a small you know, tip of the mountain that we're all crowded on you know crowd, crowded at the top trying to 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 you know keep sort of make our fight for air and space and um 
I think that there's there's always like there's always room to ascend, but I think sometimes you've got to like come down the mountain a little bit and then and then you know acclimate and then bring bring back up. And I I, I feel like this idea of small has always troubled me. I, I think that there's there's some space. The the the, the, the market is really open to coffee and new experiences and it's it's often and I, this came up in, in 2012 or 2013 and one of the the research studies that we did is that it's it's intimidating for them to get to the top of the mountain and expect that, that a coffee drinker that's kind of new to this specialty coffee thing go right up to the pinnacle or the peak and and um, I, I think that we can can re bring go down the mountain a little bit and bring people up and so I, I think that's I don't think that means sacrificing standards but I think it means maybe um, focusing on ones that are more accessible um, for different types of audiences and Tracy you're gonna get the last word thanks all four of you for this great conversation obviously this is a short just the tip of the iceberg and, and a larger topic and in our later workshops and during your breaks and such, I encourage everyone to continue the conversation. We do have the app back up again. And if you look in the feed, you'll see that the question has been renewed. There's only a couple people who voted so far. So if everyone wants to vote again, and if you didn't vote before, before it's okay, you can vote again. We're doing it by percentage, not uh, the other way. And then we'll find out kind of how your feelings have changed. Thanks, Tracy, Josh, Teresa. Thank you so much. Dan, Thank everyone, you. round of applause Thank for our you. panelists.